War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Almer and Louise Maud Book One, Chapter Three Read for LibriVox by Nomenphile Anna Pavlovna's reception was in full swing. The spindles hummed steadily and ceaselessly on all sides. With the exception of the aunt, beside whom sat only one elderly lady, who, with her thin, careworn face, was rather out of place in this brilliant society, the whole company had settled into three groups. One, chiefly masculine, had formed round the abbe. Another, of young people, was grouped round the beautiful Princess Helene, Prince Vasily's daughter, and the little Princess Bolkonskaya, very pretty and rosy, though rather too plump for her age. The third group was gathered round Montmartre and Anna Pavlovna. The vicomte was a nice-looking young man, with soft features and polished manners, who evidently considered himself a celebrity, but out of politeness modestly placed himself at the disposal of the circle in which he found himself. Anna Pavlovna was obviously serving him up as a treat to her guests. As a clever maitre d'hôtel serves up as a specially choice delicacy a piece of meat that no one who had seen it in the kitchen would have cared to eat, so Anna Pavlovna served up to her guests first the vicomte and then the abbé, as particularly choice morsels. The group about Montmartre immediately began discussing the murder of the Duc d'Aiguin. The vicomte said that the Duc d'Aiguin had perished by his own magnanimity, and that there were particular reasons for Bonaparte's hatred of him. "'Ah, yes, do tell us all about it, Vicomte,' said Anna Pavlovna, with a pleasant feeling that there was something à la Louis the Fifteenth in the sound of that sentence. "'Contesnos cela, Vicomte.' The Vicomte bowed and smiled courteously, in token of his willingness to comply. Anna Pavlovna arranged the group around him, inviting everyone to listen to his tale. "'The vicomte knew the duke personally,' whispered Anna Pavlovna to one of her guests. "'The vicomte is a wonderful raconteur,' said she to another. "'How evidently he belongs to the best society,' she said to a third. And the vicomte was served up to the company in the choicest and most advantageous style, like a well-garnished joint of roast beef on a hot dish. The vicomte wished to begin his story and gave a subtle smile. "'Come over here, Helen, dear,' said Anna Pavlovna to the beautiful young princess who was sitting some way off the centre of another group. The princess smiled. She rose with the same unchanging smile with which she had first entered the room, the smile of a perfectly beautiful woman. With the slightest rustle of her white dress, trimmed with moss and ivy, with a gleam of her white shoulders, glossy hair, and sparkling diamonds, she passed between the men who made way for her, not looking at any of them, but smiling on all, as if graciously allowing each the privilege of admiring her beautiful figure and shapely shoulders, back, and bosom, which in the fashion of those days were very much exposed. And she seemed to bring the glamour of the ballroom with her as she moved toward Anna Pavlovna. Helene was so lovely that not only did she not show any trace of coquetry, but, on the contrary, she even appeared shy of her unquestionable and all-too-victorious beauty. She seemed to wish, but to be unable to diminish its effect. "'How lovely!' everyone said who saw her. And the vicomte lifted his shoulders and dropped his eyes as if startled by something extraordinary when she took her seat opposite and beamed upon him also with her unchanging smile. "'Madam, I doubt my ability before such an audience.' he said, smiling and inclining his head. The princess rested her bare, round arm on a little table and considered a reply unnecessary. She smilingly waited. All the time the story was being told, she sat upright, glancing now at her beautiful round arm, altered in its shape by its pressure on the table, now at her still more beautiful bosom, on which she readjusted a diamond necklace. From time to time she smoothed the folds of her dress, and whenever the story produced an effect, she glanced at Anna Pavlovna, at once adopted just the expression she saw on the maid of honor's face, and again relapsed into her radiant smile. The little princess had also left the tea-table and followed Helene. "'Wait a moment, I'll get my work,' 
Now then, what are you thinking of? She went on, turning to Prince Hippolyte. Fetch my work bag. There was a general movement as the princess, smiling and talking merrily to everyone at once, sat down and gaily arranged herself in the seat. Now I am all right, she said, and asking the vicomte to begin, she took up her work. Prince Hippolyte, having brought the work bag, joined the circle and, moving a chair close to hers, seated himself beside her. Le charmant Hippolyte was surprising by his extraordinary resemblance to his beautiful sister, but yet more by the fact that in spite of this resemblance he was exceedingly ugly. His features were like his sister's, but while in her case everything was lit up by a joyous, self-satisfied, youthful and constant smile of animation, and by the wonderful classic beauty of her figure, his face, on the contrary, was dulled by imbecility and a constant expression of sullen self-confidence, while his body was thin and weak. His eyes, nose, and mouth all seemed puckered into a vacant, wearied grimace, and his arms and legs always fell into unnatural positions. "'It's not going to be a ghost story,' he said, sitting down beside the princess, and hastily adjusting his lorgnette, as if without this instrument he could not begin to speak. "'Why, no, my dear fellow,' said the astonished narrator, shrugging his shoulders. "'Because I hate ghost stories,' said Prince Hippolyte, in a tone which showed that he only understood the meaning of his words after he had uttered them. He spoke with such self-confidence that his hearers could not be sure whether what he said was very witty or very stupid. He was dressed in a dark green dress coat, knee-breeches of the color of Kis de Nif Efere, as he called it, shoes and silk stockings. The vicomte told his tale very neatly. It was an anecdote then current to the effect that the Duc d'Aiguine had gone secretly to Paris to visit Mademoiselle Georges, that at her house he came upon Bonaparte, who also enjoyed the famous actress's favors, and that in his presence Napoleon happened to fall into one of the fainting fits to which he was subject, and was thus at the Duke's mercy. The latter spared him, and this magnanimity Bonaparte subsequently repaid by death. The story was very pretty and interesting, especially at the point where the rivals suddenly recognized one another, and the ladies looked agitated. Charming, said Anna Pavlovna, with an inquiring glance at the little princess. Charming, whispered the little princess, sticking a needle into her work, as if to testify that the interest and fascination of the story prevented her from going on with it. The vicomte appreciated this silent praise, and smiling gratefully, prepared to continue. But just then, Anna Pavlovna, who had kept a watchful eye on the young man who so alarmed her, noticed that he was talking too loudly and vehemently with the abbé, so she hurried to the rescue. Pierre had managed to start a conversation with the abbé about the balance of power, and the latter, evidently interested by the young man's simple-minded eagerness, was explaining his pet theory. Both were talking and listening too eagerly and too naturally, which was why Anna Pavlovna disapproved. The means are the balance of power in Europe and the rights of the people, the abbé was saying. It is only necessary for one powerful nation like Russia, barbaric as she is said to be, to place herself disinterestedly at the head of an alliance having for its object the maintenance of the balance of power in Europe, and it would save the world. But how are you to get such a balance? Pierre was beginning at the moment Anna Pavlovna came up, and, looking severely at Pierre, asked the Italian how he stood the Russian climate. The Italian's face instantly changed and assumed an offensively affected, sugary expression, evidently habitual to him when conversing with women. I am so enchanted by the brilliancy of the wit and culture of the society, more especially of the feminine society, in which I have the honor of being received, that I have not yet had time to think of the climate, he said. Not letting the abbé and Pierre escape, Anna Pavlovna, the more conveniently to keep them under observation, brought them into the larger circle. End of chapter 3